in this video we will learn how to import external data into excel since excel is a very popular application for data analysis in most businesses there is a frequent need to import data from other applications and data sources excel has got many tools that let you import data from external databases such as access sql server oracle from web services and websites even flat files and csv files in this video we will import data from an access database to do that on the data tab click get external data excel displays the data sources from which you can import data you can import from access from website from text files and other sources these other sources include sql server analysis servers windows azure marketplace o data feed and lots of other options let us select access excel opens the file explorer window navigate to the folder where you have the access database select the database file and click open in the select table dialog box we need to select which tables we want to import into excel we are going to import the assets table so let us select that click okay in the import data dialog box excel wants to know how we want to view this data in our workbook do we want to show it as a table or as a pivot table or as pivot chart or we only want to create connections that will use to import data later let us import the entire table and let us import in the existing worksheet only let us select the cell where we want to import click okay and you can see that excel has imported data from access into excel worksheet in this video we will learn how to audit or check formulas for errors sometimes you may find that a formula that you entered in excel is not working as expected or maybe it has stopped working after you made changes to the worksheet you can use the formula auditing tools to check for errors in your formula on the formulas tab in the formula auditing group we have multiple tools available to check our formula we can use the concept of precedent and dependent cells to audit the formulas a precedent cell is the one that is using the formula a dependent cell is one which uses the result of the formula using precedent and dependent we can see if the formula is using the correct input and if its output is going to the right formula on the worksheet to trace precedents on the formulas tab in the formula auditing group click trace precedent you can see that excel displays arrows coming into the formula these arrows tell us which cells are being used in the formula here If you look at the formula you can see we are using two cells a2 and b2 and we have two arrows one from a2 and one from b2 coming into the cell c2 If you click trace dependents it tells us which cells have formulas that are using the result of the formula in cell c2 You can see that there is an arrow going into d2 and there is an arrow going into e2 so the formulas in cell d2 and cell e2 are using the result of the formula in cell c2 using these dependents and precedents you can verify if your formula has been entered correctly click remove arrows to remove these precedent and dependent arrows from your worksheet if you want to see formulas in your worksheet click show formulas in the formula auditing group on formula tab and excel will display all the cells with formulas you can now see all the formulas on this worksheet 
if you click show formulas again, start showing the result of the formulas in cells. The error checking tool checks all the formulas for any possible errors. If you click error checking, it checks all the formulas. In this case, it is telling us it is complete for the entire sheet and it did not find an error. If it finds an error, it will display the error and then you can use the information to correct the errors. Let us use another very useful tool called evaluate formula. Using evaluate formula, we can see how the formula is being executed. It is especially useful if you have a complex formula. For example, here in cell E2, we have a formula that uses write, len, and find three functions. So this is a compound or complex formula. When we create formulas like these, sometimes we may enter it incorrectly. If the formula is not working as desired, then it becomes difficult to figure out why it is not working. In such cases, we can use the evaluate formula tool to see how the formula is getting evaluated and identify any errors. So let us use evaluate formula. In the evaluate formula dialog box, you can see your formula in the evaluation box. Click evaluate. The first step of the formula has been executed. So the formula was right C2. The C2 value has been replaced. You can see Vivek.Sharma has been replaced here. The other two parameters need to be evaluated. If we click evaluate button again, now the first parameter in the first formula, the right formula is being evaluated. Now C2 has been replaced by Vivek.Sharma. Click evaluate again. Now the len C2 formula has executed and you can see the result 12. The next step is C2 value in the find function. Now you can see that the two functions len and find have been executed and their results are 12 minus 6. So this function is going to be executed next. So the result is 6 and the final result of the formula is Sharma, which is the expected result. When we have lots of formulas in a very large worksheet, it becomes difficult for us to visually look at the results of the formulas as we make changes to the worksheet. In such cases, we can use the watch window to see how the result of the formula changes as we make changes to the worksheet. If you want to watch a single formula, you can select the cell with the formula. If you want to select all the cells which have formula, there's an easy way to do that. On the home tab, select find and select in the editing group and then select formula from the drop down. And you can see that Excel has selected all the cells which have formula on this worksheet. Let us use just one to illustrate how watch window works. So on the formulas tab, select watch window. In the watch window dialog box, click add watch. The add watch dialog box asks us to select the formula that we want to add to watch window. Since we had selected E2, it is being selected here. Click add and the formula now gets added to the watch window. It is showing us the formula and its current value. Now let us make some change to the data and see what happens in the watch window. So select cell A2 and let us make some changes to this data. Let us change the last name here from Sharma to Mittal. And now you can see in the watch window, the value has changed from Sharma to Mittal. So when you're using a very large worksheet with too many formulas and you can't see all the formulas as you make changes to the worksheet, the watch window becomes very handy to keep an eye on how the results of the formula are changing as you make changes to the worksheet. In this video, we will learn how to convert text to columns using text to column tool.
if your worksheet has a column with text data, you can split the data in this cell or this column into multiple columns. For example, here we have a column full name where we have first name and last name. If we want to extract first name and last name from this information, we can use text to columns tool to extract the first name and last name into separate columns. Let us do that. On the data tab, in the data tools group, select text to columns. In convert text to columns wizard, we will define how Excel needs to convert this column into two columns. The step one of this wizard asks us to tell it how Excel should split the cell into multiple cells. We can either use the delimited option or the fixed width option. If your data is delimited, that is separated by comma, space, or tab, it is called delimited, and we can use the delimited option. If your data is of fixed width, then we can use the fixed width option. In our case, the first name and last name are separated by space. So it is a delimited data. Also notice that the first name and last names are not of same length. So we cannot use the fixed width option to split this cell. Let us select delimited and click next. In step two, we need to tell Excel what kind of delimiter is separating our data. In our case, it is space. So uncheck the tab and select the space. If your data has multiple delimiters, you can select treat consecutive delimiters as one. So if a cell has two spaces between first name and last name, those two spaces will be treated as a single space. Click next to go to step three. In step three, we select the data type that is there in our cell and we select the destination cells where the result of this function is to be displayed. So in the destination cells, let us select cells B2 and C2 because that is where the first name and last name will be displayed. Click finish and you can see that the first name and last name have been successfully extracted from full name. In this video, we will use Power Pivot to import data into Excel. Power Pivot is a very powerful data import and management tool available in Excel. You can access it on the Power Pivot tab. Using Power Pivot, you can import data, you can modify and process data before it is imported into Excel. You can create data models that you can use then to analyze your data in Excel or use pivot tables and pivot charts to analyze your data. Let us use Power Pivot to import data from Access. To import data, click Manage in the Data Model group on Power Pivot tab. Excel opens the Power Pivot window. Notice that this window is separate from the Excel workbook window. On the Home tab of Power Pivot window, we have options for importing data. Since we want to import data from Access, select From Database and from the drop down list, select From Access. In the Table Import Wizard dialog box, we need to provide the database detail for Power Pivot to connect to the database. You can give your connection a name so you can easily identify the data source for this connection. In the database name box, you enter the name of the database. Since it is an access database, we need to provide the full path along with the database name. So click on Browse to locate the database. Navigate to the folder on your computer where the database is stored. Select the database name and click Open. If your database has a username and password, you need to enter that in the logon to the database section. Click Next button. You need to decide how you are going to import the data. You want to select from the list of tables or you want to write a query. Let us select the list of table and views option. Click Next. Now the table import wizard displays all the tables in the database that we selected. Let us select the assets database. When you import tables, Power Pivot also imports relationship between tables. So if two tables are related in a relational database, those relationships will also be imported into Power Pivot. 
if you don't know which tables are related in your database, select the table you want to import and then click select related table. And you can see that the wizard has already selected another table contacts, which is related to the assets table. You can preview the data and filter the data before importing it. If you click on preview and filter, it shows you the data in the table. This data is from the table assets. And right now all the rows in the table are selected. If you want, you can only import selected data from the table. Let's leave it select all, click OK, and click finish. The table import wizard has finished importing the data and it is successful. Click close. And now you can see the tables in the Power Pivot window. When you import a table in Power Pivot, it is imported on a new worksheet. Since we imported two tables, we have two worksheets here, assets worksheet and contacts worksheet. The data that you import using Power Pivot is stored in an analytical database inside the Excel workbook. The data is not displayed in Excel workbook. The data is displayed in the Power Pivot window, but the data resides in the workbook in an analytical database. Because it is available in the workbook, you can use it for analysis using pivot table, pivot chart, and other Excel features. Power Pivot currently supports files up to 2 GB in size, and you can work with up to 4 GB of data in memory. Let us use the Power Pivot data to create a pivot table. So in the Excel workbook, on the Insert tab, click Pivot Table in the Tables group. In the Create Pivot Table dialog box, select Use this workbook's data model. Click OK. Now you can see that Excel has inserted the pivot table with data from assets and contacts table that we imported in the Power Pivot window. So the data that we imported in Power Pivot window is available in our Excel workbook for analysis. In this video, we will use a case study to help Vikram import product data from an external source create data validation rules to ensure consistency of data in the spreadsheet, and to group the data using the outline tool. If you remember from our earlier case studies, Vikram is now sales manager in the company headquarters, and he is in charge of managing sales across multiple stores. While reviewing quarterly sales reports from different stores, he noticed several inconsistencies in the worksheets. Since each store creates its reports manually, the same product name is entered differently across stores. As a result, Vikram's team has to spend a lot of time in cleaning up the reports before they consolidate into a common report that can be sent to the senior executives. So Vikram has asked his team to create a master list of products and create an Excel report template that should be used by all the stores. By using a master list of products, they can ensure that all stores use the same name. The product list is created in an MS Access table. In this case study, we'll import the data from this Access table into Excel workbook, and we'll set up a data validation rule for product names. In the report template, you'll also calculate the quarterly sales using subtotal tool. In this video, we will use the product names from MS Access database using get and transform tool. We'll then apply data validation rules to the product name cells. This is the new report template being prepared by Vikram's team. The first column has quarter. You can see Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. The start date, end date. Column for product name, unit sales, list price, discount, net price, and sales amount. The product name column is blank right now, and Vikram's team wants to ensure that each store enters product name based on the name provided in the MS Access database. So let us first import those names into this workbook. Then we'll apply the data validation rules to these cells to ensure that only the names in the imported list 
can be entered in these cells. So let us first import the product names from MS Access database. To do that, on the data tab, in the get and transform group, click new query. From the list of options, select from database and then select from Microsoft Access database. In the import table dialog box, navigate to the folder where you have the access database, select the access database file and click import. Excel displays the navigator pane. In the navigator, on the left side, under display options, select the table that you want to import. The navigator displays the data from the table. You can see both the data structure, the columns, and the data in the table. So the navigator allows us to preview the data before we import into Excel. We can either load the data directly or we can edit before importing. So let us edit data in this table before we import. Click the edit button. Excel now displays the query editor window. The query editor allows us to build query for importing data into Excel. We can select which columns to import. We can remove columns. We can remove rows. We can apply transformation. So we can prepare the data before we import into Excel. The important thing to remember here is all these operations that you perform in query editor do not change the original data. The original data, in this case, the MS Access table, is not changed by what we do in query editor. Whatever we do in query editor is recorded and displayed in applied steps area in the query settings pane. If you are not happy with a step, you can delete the step. Once you are happy with all the steps, then you can load the data into Excel. In this case, we want to import the product name and the unit price. We don't want to import the product category and the product ID. So let us select product name and unit price columns. Click choose columns in the manage columns group on home tab in query editor window. In the choose columns dialog box, let us first unselect all the columns and then select product name and unit price. Click OK. And now query editor displays data from only these two columns. In the applied steps area, now you can see the third step removed other columns. So now that we have prepared the data that we want to import, click on the small down arrow in close and load and then from the list select close and load to. In the load to dialog box, select how you want to view this data in your workbook. We want to view it as a table and we want it to go in a new worksheet. Click load. Excel has now created a new worksheet and it puts the data from the table in this worksheet. The two columns have been imported. So now that we have the product name imported in the worksheet, let us apply data validation to product name cells. So let us select the entire cell range where the product names will be entered. On the data tab, in the data tools group, select data validation. In the data validation dialog box, on the settings tab, in the validation criteria, in the allow box, click on this drop down and select list. We want Excel to allow values from a list. And the source of data for the list is on sheet one. In the cells that contain the names we have already imported. So what we are telling Excel now is, in the product name cells that we have selected, it should only allow 
a value that is included in the list in this cell range. We also don't want people to enter blank as product name. So we'll uncheck, ignore blank checkbox. We want to give people option to select product names from a drop down list so they don't have to type it. So we'll leave the checkbox for in cell drop down selected. Click OK. Now you can see that the cell has a drop down next to it. If you click on it, it displays the product names that we have already entered and we can select from it. If we enter a name that is not there, Excel displays an error message. So this is how we can import data from external sources using get and transform and apply data validation in our worksheet. Let us do one more thing in our workbook. We want the list price cell to pick up the list price from the values we have imported. So let us enter the formula. You are already familiar with it. We are using index and match functions. And you can see that the price has been picked. Sony headphone, the price is 2000. It has been picked correctly. In this video, we will use the subtotal function to outline data in this worksheet. So we have entered the product names and the list price is there from the data that was imported. So we'll use the subtotal tool to insert a summary row at the end of each quarter that displays the sales for all the products in that quarter. Click anywhere in the data range for which you want to apply a subtotal function. So we have selected A2 here. On the data tab, in the outline group, click subtotal. In the subtotal dialog box, in the at each change in box, we'll select quarter because we want to display subtotal when the quarter changes. In the use function box, we'll select sum because subtotal is a sum. In the add subtotal to area, sales amount is selected. We want to create a subtotal for sales amount. If you want to create subtotal for unit sales, you can select it and subtotal will be displayed for unit sales as well. In the case study, we only want to display a subtotal for sales amount. So we'll leave it as it is. We have selected the replace current totals checkbox so that if there is already a subtotal, it will be replaced. We want to display the summary row below the data. So we have selected this checkbox. Click OK. And now you can see that at the end of each quarter, there's a new row that has been inserted, which has the subtotal for the quarter. Saurabh is a sales manager in a company responsible for the performance of different sales channel in the territory. The channels include company's own stores, retail chains, independent stores, and salaried sales staff selling to the companies. He has prepared the quarterly sales report for two regions in the territory. The report is an important input in forecasting and planning sales for the next quarter. You need to help Saurabh print the worksheets as a PDF for distribution to his sales team. In this case study, we will print both Region 1 and Region 2 worksheets together. In the printed worksheet, we will add a header and a footer. In this video, we will print the worksheets as a PDF. Since Excel does not have a standard page structure, printing Excel worksheets requires some extra steps to ensure worksheets are printed correctly. We can quickly fine tune the worksheet in the page layout view. We can see and edit elements such as margins, page orientation, print size, etc. Excel allows you to print worksheets one at a time or several worksheets at one shot. Let us print both region 1 and region 2 worksheets together. Select 
the region 1 sheet tab, hold down shift key and then select region 2 sheet tab. Excel groups both the worksheets. In the page setup group, click the margins tool to apply margins in our printed worksheet. Margins are the blank space between the worksheet data and the edges of the printed page. Excel displays the standard margin options. You can select one of the predefined margins or click custom margins to customize it. Let us select normal margins. Click the orientation tool. Excel displays the two orientation options, portrait and landscape. Let us select landscape mode to print the worksheets as we have many columns in the worksheet. Next, select the size tool. There are several page sizes you can choose from for your worksheet. Excel will organize the worksheet data according to the size and orientation when printing. Let us select paper size A4 to print our worksheets. Click the print titles tool. Excel displays the page setup dialog box. In the print area, you can select preferences including if you want the grid lines to appear on your printed worksheet. Grid lines makes it easy to read the printed data. Select the row and column headings checkbox in the print section. Select header and footer tab to insert a header and footer in the worksheets. Click the custom header button. In the header dialog box, click the center section text box. In the center section text box, let us type sales channel analysis. This is the heading that will appear on each printed page so we should format it. Click the format button. Select bold font and the appropriate size. Click OK. Select the right section text box. Click the date button to insert current date on the header. Each printed page will display the current date on the right side of the page. Click OK. Click custom footer button. Click the right section text box. Let us add the page numbers in the footer. Click the OK button. Click OK again. Select file tab on the ribbon. Excel displays the backstage view. Select the print option. Excel shows the print preview showing how it will print the worksheet. On the left hand side, you can set your print options. On the right hand side, Excel shows the print preview showing how it will print the worksheet. Click the printer selection list box. Excel displays various printing options. You can either select a printer or you can print the workbook to a file or as a PDF. Let us print the worksheets as a PDF. To do so, select the Microsoft Print to PDF option. Note in the preview section on the right hand side, all columns of the worksheet do not fit in one page. To fit all the columns in one page, click the No Scaling List box. From the list, select Fit All Columns on One Page. Note that all the columns now fit in one page. Under Settings, select Collated List box. We want to print the two pages of Region 1 worksheet first and then the two pages of region 2 worksheet. Therefore, from the collated list box, select option collated 
1, 2, 3. If we select uncollated, Excel will print first page of region 1 sheet, then first page of region 2 sheet and then the second pages. Let us preview all the pages of the worksheets. On the bottom of the screen, click the next page arrow. We can preview the second page of the worksheet region 1. Click the next page arrow again. You can now preview the first page of the worksheet region 2. In the right bottom corner, you will see two icons. The first icon is the show margins icon. When you click this, Excel will show you the margins in print preview as you have set them. The next icon is the zoom to page. This shows you the active worksheet as it appears at 100% magnification. As you can see below, the active worksheet takes up more of the screen and is easier to read. Although you may have to scroll down or up to see the entire page. Click the print button to print the worksheets to a PDF. Select the folder where you want to save the PDF. Let us save the PDF as Sales Channel Analysis. Open the PDF. You can see both the worksheets are printed with the header and footer we inserted. Saurabh can now distribute this PDF to the entire sales team. In this video, we will use a case study to learn how to create a macro to insert a new worksheet and assign the macro to a button control. In chapter 13 case study, we help Vikram's team create a new sales report template which will be used by all stores. Since the worksheet is designed to store data for one year, the stores will need to copy the worksheet to create a new worksheet for the next year. In this case study, we will help Vikram create a macro to copy and insert the worksheet for new year. We'll assign the macro to a button control so the store staff can click the button to insert the new worksheet. In this video, we will create a macro to insert a new worksheet and assign the macro to a button control. If you remember from chapter 13 case study, this is the sales report template that we help Vikram's team create. We'll now create a macro to insert a copy of this worksheet in the workbook. You can create macros on the developer tab. On developer tab, in the code group, click record macro to start recording the macro. In the record macro dialog box, in the macro name, Enter the name of the macro that you want to give. Let us give the macro name New Worksheet. When you create a macro, you can also assign it a shortcut key. Control plus any key that you assign. Since we are going to assign the macro to a control, let us not assign a shortcut key here. When you create a macro, you can store it in the current workbook the macro will be available only in this current workbook. If you want the macro to be available all across Excel, then select Personal Macro Workbook from the list. When you save macro in Personal Macro Workbook, Excel creates a hidden Personal Macro Workbook file and stores the macro in this. The macro then is available in any workbook you open in Excel. In our case, we'll store the macro in the current workbook. So let us select this workbook and click OK to start recording the macro. Now you can see that the button has changed to stop recording. Right click on quarterly sales 2015-16 tab and from the list, select move or copy. In the move or copy dialog box, in the before sheet area, select sheet 2 because we want to insert the new sheet before sheet 2. Select create a copy checkbox and click OK. Excel inserts a new worksheet. 
Let us now stop recording the macro. Click the stop recording button in the code group on developer tab. Now the macro has been recorded. If we click on macros, we can see the new worksheet macro in the macro list. If we run this macro, it inserts a new worksheet. Let us delete this new worksheet here. We'll now create a button control and assign the macro to it. To create the button control, in the controls group on developer tab, click insert and from the list, select the first option button. Drag the mouse to create the button control. As soon as you leave your mouse, the assign macro dialog box opens. In the macro name area, select new worksheet and click OK. Excel has now assigned the macro to this button control we just created. Let us now rename this button. Right click on the button and select edit text. Let us call this button insert new worksheet. Now the button has been created and the macro has been assigned. If we click on this button, it runs the macro and inserts the new worksheet. Let us save this workbook. Click the file tab and then click save as button. In the save as dialog box, in the save as type, select Excel macro enable workbook and then click save to save the workbook. The workbook has now been saved along with the macro. In this video, you will learn how to save and share Excel files. Excel supports several different file formats. The backstage view in Excel has several options for saving your files. Select the File tab. Excel opens the backstage view. Click Save As. Excel displays the Save As dialog box. Click the Save As Type drop down list. Excel displays the list of supported file types. By default, Excel workbooks are saved in the .xlsx file type. However, there may be times when we need to use another file type. From this list, we can select the file type we want to save the worksheet in. We can also easily export the workbook from Excel in a variety of file types. Exporting the workbook as an Adobe Acrobat document, commonly known as PDF file, can be especially useful if we are sharing a workbook with someone who does not have Excel. A PDF will make it possible for recipients to view but not edit the content of the workbook. Click Export, then click Create PDF slash XPS. The Save as dialog box appears. Select the location where we want to export the workbook and enter a file name. By default, Excel will only export the worksheet. Since we have multiple worksheets and we want to save all of them in the same PDF file, we need to click Options. The Options dialog box appears. Select Entire Workbook and click OK. Let us click Publish. Whenever we export a workbook as a PDF, we need to consider how the workbook data will appear on each page of the PDF, just like printing a workbook. Excel 2013 onwards, it makes it very easy to share and collaborate on workbooks using OneDrive. Earlier, we could send a workbook as an email attachment. While convenient, this system also creates multiple versions of the same file, which can be difficult to organize. When we share a workbook from Excel, we are actually giving others access to the exact same file. This lets us and the people we share with 
edit the same workbook without having to keep track of multiple versions. To share a workbook, click the File tab to access Backstage view and then click Share. The Share pane appears. To share the workbook, we need to first save it to our OneDrive. We can also email the workbook and send it as an attachment. In Excel 2016, there is a new Share tab on the ribbon. To share the workbook, click Share. Since we haven't yet saved the spreadsheet to OneDrive, OneDrive for Business or SharePoint, we are prompted to do so now. Select Save to Cloud and choose a location to save the workbook. Once the workbook is saved to a shared location, we can then invite others to work on it as well. We can also email workbooks near the bottom of the share pane, select send as attachment, select either send a copy or send a PDF. Excel opens the email application and attaches the file to a new message. Just fill in the details such as email addresses and a short message and click send. In this video, you will learn how to split the cells in a workbook and how to switch between multiple workbooks. You can make your work easier when working with large worksheets by splitting the worksheet. Working on a huge worksheet that has significant information is very tedious and time consuming, especially when you are constantly scrolling up, down, left and right just to see and work at different parts of the worksheet. By using the different views of Excel, you will be able to save lot of time and effort in manipulating your workbooks and worksheets. Let us split this worksheet. Click the cells where the split should occur. Then click on the View tab. Click the Split button. Notice Excel splits the worksheet in two windows. We are really working on one worksheet which appears double on the screen at the same time. We can scroll up and down in both the windows. To remove the split, click the View tab and click on Split again. Excel removes the split from the worksheet. Sometimes we want to switch between multiple open Excel files. To do so, go to the View tab and click on Switch Windows button. Choose the workbook to move to from the list of available open files. There is a check next to the file that we are currently viewing for easy reference. To move back and forth between any open windows, we can also use the combination of Alt plus Tab key. Hold the Alt key down and press Tab to cycle through all the files. In this video, you will learn how to protect your workbooks. First, let us discuss how to protect the structure of a workbook. To prevent other users from viewing hidden worksheets, adding, moving, deleting or hiding worksheets and renaming worksheets, we can protect the structure of Excel workbook with a password. To do so, on the Review tab, in the Changes group, click Protect workbook. Enter a password in the password box. Click OK and retype the password to confirm it. To check if the workbook is protected, on the Review tab, see the Protect workbook icon. If it's highlighted, then the workbook is protected. Next, 
Let us see how to protect specific data in a worksheet. To prevent others from accidentally or deliberately changing, moving or deleting data in a worksheet, we can lock the cells on the Excel worksheet and then protect the sheet with a password. With worksheet protection, we can lock certain cells or formulas which users will not be able to modify. Worksheet protection is a two-step process. The first step is to unlock cells that others can edit and then lock the cells that cannot be edited and protect the worksheet with or without a password. So first let us select all cells. Right click anywhere in the sheet and select Format Cells. Next, go to the Protection tab and clear Locked. So this unlocks the entire worksheet. Next step is to lock certain cells and protect the worksheet. Let us select the cells to be locked. Right click and select Format Cells. Then go to the Protection tab and now select Locked. So these cells are locked. On the Review tab, select Protect Worksheet. In the Allow All Users of this Worksheet to list, we need to select the elements that people can change. We have selected Locked and Unlocked cells. Additionally, we can also specify a password to lock the worksheet. A password prevents other people from removing the worksheet protection as it needs to be entered to unprotect the sheet. Let us enter a password in the password to unprotect sheet box and click OK. Re-enter the password in the confirm password dialog box and click OK. Now let us close this file and reopen. Notice that if we try to edit the locked cells, it asks for a password. However, we can edit the unlocked cells. We can also selectively give read or edit access to different users on the same Excel file by setting two passwords. One for edit and one for read. We can then share the appropriate passwords with the users depending on the access level they should have. Let us protect this file. Click the File tab. Then click Save As. Click a location to save the file. Let us save this file on desktop. In the Save As dialog box, click Tools. And then click General Options. We can specify one or both passwords here. One to open the file, another to modify the file. Click Save. Now let us open this file. Excel prompts for a password. A second screen shows if there is a password to modify the file. Users who do not have the Modify password can click Read Only and start viewing the contents of the file. VBA, which stands for Visual Basic for Applications, is the programming language of Excel and other office programs. Let us first understand the development environment within Excel for VBA. This development environment is called the Visual Basic Editor. There are multiple ways you can get into the Visual Basic Editor. Go to the Developer tab. In the Code section, click Visual Basic button. Notice that we can also use shortcut key Alt plus F11. This is the default VBA environment where we can write our code. This is the Project Explorer window 
and this is the properties sheet. If this gets closed by mistake, you can go to the view menu. Underneath view menu, select the project explorer or properties window to reopen the windows. This is the default environment within the Visual Basic Editor. This is where we can develop macros and procedures. Notice that the project is making reference to our workbook Learn VBA. It is making reference to the single sheet in the workbook and to the active workbook. We need some place to write our Visual Basic code. There are various places where we can write the code, but most commonly we can code in modules. There is no module in this project. Go to the Insert tab, select Module. In the project window, Excel VBA inserts a modules folder with single module. This is the empty module where we can write our custom Visual Basic code. In the next session, we will discuss the basic concepts of VBA programming. In this session, I will introduce you to the basic concepts of VBA. We have got the module. Now, we need to write the code. There can be two different types of block of code, procedure or function. More common block of code is a procedure or a sub-procedure as you might refer to. You will learn both procedures and functions in the case studies. End users will refer to procedures as a macro while we call it a procedure or a sub-procedure. Here is how you start creating the structure for the procedure. Go to the Insert tab, click Procedure. In the Add Procedure window, give it a name without spaces. Let us name it as Learn VBA. You can give any name. Select Type as Sub. It runs a block of code and does not return any value. Select scope as public. Public means within this project, we can reference the procedure anywhere and utilize it anywhere in the project. It is a sub-procedure called Learn VBA and ends with end sub. We need to write all the lines of code between these two lines. Next, very important concept you need to understand is variables. This is extremely important and you need to master this foundational concept in any programming. Here is how we work with variables. Within this procedure, we need to declare a variable type dim. Dim is the reserved keyword within Excel VBA to declare a variable. Then we need to give a name. I will call it test input. You can give any name without spaces. Then we declare the type of this variable. Code as and we will choose string. We are expecting the value in this variable to be of some text value. The purpose of this variable is to gather data from some source. For example, input from the user like the first name or value in the active cell in a worksheet and then get that data in this code. The value stored in the variable could be for immediate or future use. Let us code test input equals to in quotes hurry. In quotes because it is a static value. Anytime we reference test input, we should get a value hurry. Let us set the active cell dot value equal to test input. 
I will bring up the Excel worksheet side by side. We can watch the code run at a time. It is a great way to debug VBA code. Place the cursor anywhere within the procedure. In the worksheet, we have this cell selected, which is the active cell. I will press F8. This allows us to step into the procedure. Keep pressing F8. Hover the mouse over test input variable and you can see it equals to Hari. If I come down here, it is equal to Hari again. If I press F8 again, the value in active cell changes to Hari. You learned about variables. Now next concept you will learn is loops. In this session, I will introduce you to the basic concepts of VBA. You learned about variables. Now next concept you will learn is loops. Let me delete this code. We use loops not only in VBA but in every programming language. We use loops when we want the single line of code or a block of code to repeat multiple times. You may want it to repeat a set number of times or unknown number of times. In VBA, there are various types of loops. Here I will discuss do while loop. We will write a little bit of code that will change all the numeric values here in this sheet to bold. In the procedure, let us code do while active cell dot value not equal to spaces. Not equal to sign is written as less than greater than symbol. Then loop. So this loop will continue till it finds a blank value in the cell. This is the do while loop. We need to code for the action to be done within this loop. Code active cell dot font dot bold is equal to true. We are setting the font of the active cell to bold. This is a boolean operator. So it is either true or false. Active cell dot active cell means the cell we are currently on in the worksheet. Offset is the method we will use. We are going to tell to go down one row and zero column and select that next cell. So dot select. This loop will continue going until it finds that empty cell. Press the play button to run the procedure. It made each of those numbers in the sheet bold. What if we want only specific sales figures to be bold and not all the sales figures? We can write conditional logic for that. Let us make only those sales figures bold which are greater than or equal to 20,000. First, I will unbold all these sales figures. We will use an if statement to build this logic. If active cell dot value greater than equal to 20,000 then end if. Anytime you open something like if you got to end it. Now active cell dot font dot bold is equals to true. So only if the cell value is greater than 20,000, make the cell bold. 
If not, move to the next cell. Press the play button. You can see that only sales figures greater than or equal to 20,000 are bold. You will master all these concepts in the case studies discussed later in this chapter. Let me first explain the case study we will work on. Hari is the sales head for a company which sells headphones. He has created a worksheet with a standard template to report the yearly sales of the company. We will help Hari in creating a macro which will automate the process of inserting a new worksheet for reporting the sales of the company for any specific year. Then we will edit the macro using Visual Basic Editor to make it more dynamic and reusable. Let us create a macro to copy the template worksheet and insert a new worksheet for a specific year. I will select 2016 worksheet which is the template worksheet. On the developer tab, in the code group, click record macro button. Excel displays the record macro dialog box. Let us enter insert new worksheet in the macro name box. Remember that you cannot have spaces in the macro name. I will enter the shortcut key as Ctrl plus L. So when we have to run the macro, we can run the macro using this shortcut key assigned to this macro. Next, we can give a description for the macro. This macro inserts a new worksheet. Click OK. Now, whatever actions we will perform will be recorded by Excel. Next, we need to copy the worksheet. Right click the worksheet tab for 2016 worksheet. Select move or copy from the list of options. In before sheet area, select move to end. Select the Create a copy checkbox and click OK. Excel inserts a new worksheet. To rename the new worksheet, double click the worksheet tab and rename it to 2017. Next, we should change the heading row of the worksheet. In the heading, I will change 2016 to 2017 since this worksheet is for 2017 sales. Now, sales data for 2017 will be different from 2016. So, let us delete the data specific to a year. Click stop recording. The macro is now recorded and stored in the workbook. Notice that all formulas and cell validations still work in the new worksheet. To save the worksheet, click the file tab and select save as in the backstage view. In save as dialog box, in save as type, select Excel macro enabled workbook. Click save. Excel saves the workbook along with the macro. One of the most powerful tools in Excel is macros and VBA. VBA stands for Visual Basic for Applications. The best way 
to learn macros and VBA is through examples. In the previous video, we recorded a macro to copy and insert a new worksheet for the yearly sales. When we recorded the macro, we copied 2016 worksheet and renamed it to 2017. There are various ways to run the macro. One of the ways is to press the shortcut key we assigned to the macro. I will press Ctrl plus L on my keyboard to run the macro. Oops, we got an error. The macro recorder is a great way to quickly automate simple tasks just by recording some action in Excel. But macros have some limitations. In this macro, we recorded duplicating the worksheet and renaming it. We renamed it to 2017. Now, when we run the macro, it gives an error. Let's see why it is showing an error. It says, the name is already taken. Try a different one. You can see that Excel inserts a new worksheet 2016-2, but it gives a runtime error because the macro is trying to insert a sheet 2017 and we already have a sheet named 2017. It does not allow us to rename the new worksheet to avoid the conflict. We can either end a macro or debug it. If we debug, it will take us to the macro code. We need to modify the macro code which we recorded to make it fully automated. In the next video, you will learn how to edit the macro. In this video, you will access the code for the macro we recorded to automatically insert a new worksheet for the yearly sales. To edit the macro, we need to access the code Excel generated when we recorded the macro. On the Developer tab, in the Code section, notice the Macros button. Click the Macros button. It opens the View Macro window. It shows the macro we recorded. From this window, we can run the macro, edit it or delete it. I will click the edit button. Excel opens a new window which is completely separate from Excel. This is the Visual Basic for Applications window. This is where Excel stores the code for the macro. Basically, all the actions we performed while recording the macro are stored here as code. On the left hand side is the Project Explorer. This window provides you with a VBA project for each currently open Excel workbook. If it gets closed by mistake, you can go to the View menu and open up the Project Explorer. When we record a macro using a macro recorder, Excel stores all the code inside modules. You can notice that Excel created a folder called Modules and a single folder called Module 1. Double click to open the module where all the code resides. Currently, it is already open. You can see that all the code is within a sub procedure called Insert New Worksheet, which is the name of our macro. When we record a macro, Excel creates a procedure with the same name as the macro name. It starts with sub and ends with end sub. In between is the code which is all the actions 
which we performed while recording the macro. Let me explain the concept of sub procedure and function in Excel Visual Basic. A set of commands to perform a specific task is placed into a procedure which can be a function procedure or a sub procedure. Function procedure is also known as function and sub procedure is also known as subroutine. The main difference between a VBA function procedure and a sub procedure is that a function procedure returns a result whereas a sub procedure does not return a result. If we are performing a task that returns a result, for example, summing up of a group of numbers, Excel will generally use a function procedure. Excel will choose to use a sub procedure if we just need a set of actions to be carried out like we are inserting a worksheet. Let us dig the code. There are some issues here. Notice it is always selecting sheet 2016 and copying after sheet 1. In the heading also it says 2017. It is renaming the sheet to 2017. Let us try changing 2017 to 2018 in the heading as well as the sheet name. Now let us try running the macro. It inserts the worksheet named 2018 and changes the heading also. But every time we want to insert a worksheet, we should not be editing the macro code. We need to automate the macro so Excel can do the job without our intervention. In the next video, you will learn how to edit the macros to make them more dynamic and more reusable. In this session, I will introduce you to the concept in VBA that deals with the worksheets. A VBA project is a collection of all the VBA objects and modules that are linked to the current workbook and will initially consist of a workbook object linked to the Excel workbook, worksheet objects linked to each worksheet of the workbook. In coding terminology, worksheet is an object. In this code, we need to fix the issue that deals with accessing and referencing the worksheets. The code is accessing 2016 worksheet. You can notice everywhere 2016, 2016. What if 2016 worksheet gets deleted? In that case, when we run the macro, it will throw an error. We do not want hard coded values like worksheet 2016. This line is selecting 2016 worksheet. We do not need this line of code because Excel may select and copy any of the worksheet, not necessarily worksheet 2016. It should ideally select and copy the active worksheet. There is no need of selecting a specific worksheet, hence let us delete this line of code. Next line of code is copying the worksheet. We want Excel to copy active worksheet, which means it should copy the sheet we are currently on. I will change this to active sheet. Notice that Visual Basic is case sensitive. As soon as I click away, it capitalizes S in the active sheet. Now it is copying the active worksheet 
and always placing it after sheet 1 in the workbook. We wanted to always put it at the end. That way, it keeps the worksheet in the chronological order of years. So, rather than one in the bracket, we need to find out how many worksheets are there in this workbook. We can get the total count of the worksheets in the workbook and then place the new worksheet at the end. It should not matter how many worksheets we have in the workbook. There could be 2, 3, 4, any number. So, in place of 1, I will use worksheets object and its property count. So, now the code is worksheets.count. VBA has a built-in worksheets object which is the collection of all the worksheets in the workbook. And count is the property of the object worksheet. With this, Excel will copy the active worksheet and place it after the last worksheet in the workbook. Down below, it is selecting 2016 worksheet and renaming it. Again, we do not need the select line of code because the new sheet Excel copied at the end is the active sheet and also selected. So, Excel has copied the worksheet and pasted it at the end. So, by default, it is the active worksheet. We need to rename the active worksheet. So, let us change this line of code so that it renames the active worksheet. In this video, you learned about the active worksheet object. In the next video, we will further edit the code to make the macro even more reusable and dynamic. In this video, you will learn how to get input from the user and then store it in the macro. The problem still with our code is in renaming the worksheet. It is always renaming it to 2018, which is not correct. It should rename it to the year for which we want to create the yearly sales report. When we or anyone runs our macro, Excel should ask for the year for which a new worksheet needs to be inserted. So, first, we need to create an interface with the user through our macro. Then, we also need to store the information that user is giving. To store the information given by the user, we need a variable. At the top of the code, I will type dim worksheet name as string. Worksheet name is the variable name where macro will store the information given by the user. You can give it any name but it has to be without spaces. Dim stands for declaring a variable. We are telling Excel that we are creating a variable named worksheet name which will store string or text values which the user will provide. We need to put something inside the storage variable. So, I will type worksheet name is equal to input box. Input box is pre-built inside VBA. Excel VBA understands that input box is for getting the information from the user. If I open parenthesis, it shows the specific content it wants. Let us prompt the user. I will type in 
type in quotes enter the worksheet here close the parenthesis now when we run this macro this input box will pop up and prompt the user to enter the year for which it wants to create a new worksheet worksheet name variable will store the input from the user where can we use this input from the user well we need to use it for renaming our active worksheet we will change active sheet name equals to worksheet name which is our variable so we are taking the input from the user and putting it into our active sheet name we still need to fix the heading of the worksheet it says year 2018 sales data we need to change the year to what the user gave as input that input is stored in the variable worksheet name remember you learned the concatenate function in excel which can combine multiple string values we will apply the same concept here in macros so let us change the heading to in quotes year space quotes closed plus worksheet name plus quotes space sales data and quotes closed notice that whatever is static is given in quotes and the variable name is given without quotes so if the user inputs the worksheet name as 2018 the heading will be year 2018 sales data in the previous case study we had helped hari create a macro to insert a new yearly sales worksheet all users accessing the yearly sales workbook may not know how to run a macro so hari now wants that as soon as the user opens up the workbook excel should show up a form like this this way user need not run the macro user can use this form to insert a new worksheet using this form user can navigate to any worksheet within the workbook for example let us select 2018 worksheet from this drop down notice excel navigates to 2018 worksheet let us select 2016 worksheet it jumps to 2016 worksheet user can also know the total sales of the current year in this case study we will help hari create this form with all these controls buttons and labels we will also code in visual basic editor in such a manner that the form shows up as soon as the user opens up the excel workbook in this session you will learn how to create an excel vba user form through which user can interact with the excel workbook let us get back into the visual basic editor to create a user form on the developer tab in the code section click the visual basic button notice you can also press alt plus f11 it opens up the vba editor we need to create a new user form to help user navigate through the excel workbook go to the insert tab on top of the screen and click user form
in the project explorer it creates a new folder forms and a form in that called user form 1 this is the form currently nothing much in it but if we hit the play button on top it will run the procedure that generated this form here it is it is a simple form see how simple it is to create a user form now we need to start adding controls to this form we can add buttons check boxes drop downs text fields etc we need to decide on the controls depending on how we want the user to interact with this form close the form to return to vba editor window now in the next session we will use this toolbox to add the controls we want just to summarize you can create a user form by going to the insert tab and clicking user form we had modules folder when we recorded the macro and now we also have a folder called forms in this session we will design our user form we will add controls or elements to the form that the user will interact with when using this workbook when you add a user form you can notice a toolbox that is floating around your screen if by mistake you close it go to the view menu on the top and select toolbox let us first create a combo box control which will have all the worksheet names in the toolbox select the fourth control on the first row which is a combo box drag and place it in the form we can resize it according to our needs the user form should be very user friendly which means user should be able to understand what information each control has so we should add a label to the control describing what the control is going to be used for from the toolbox select big capital a which is the label tool click it and drag it on the form place it above the combo box control and resize accordingly next i will add a button control when user clicks the button they should be able to add a new yearly sales report sheet you can move the controls and space them in the form so that they look good we will add one more control which is text control let me resize and place it appropriately we also need to add a label to this control this text field will show the total sales for the current year now let us press the play button to run this form we now have a form which has controls and labels in the next session we will give meaningful names to the form controls and labels in this session we will give meaningful names to the labels and controls let us close the form it takes us back to the editor window let us start with the form itself currently the form name is user form 1 click the form once to make sure it is selected go to the properties window if for some reason you do not find the properties window go to the view menu on the top and select properties window the very first property of the form is the name this name is for the developers like us to reference this form when coding i will name it as form yearly sales notice it did not change the name out on the form itself 
This name property of the form is for developers to reference it while coding. The title which user sees is changed from the caption property of the form. I will change the caption to yearly sales. Notice the title of the form which user sees is changed to yearly sales. Similarly, let us change the names and captions of the labels and controls. I will select label 1 and change the name to LBL years. Then let us give a descriptive caption because this is what the user will see. I will give the caption as select a worksheet. Next control is a combo box. I will name it as CMBX worksheets. Next, select the label 2 and name it as LBL Yearly Sales. I will change the caption to Total Sales for Year. We need to resize the boxes to fit in the text. Next control is the text box control. Let us name it to text txt yearly sales. Lastly, we need to rename the button control. Let us rename it to btn new worksheet. And change the caption to new Yearly sheet. We need to resize the button to fit in the caption. Make sure that you give names and descriptive caption to all the controls in your form. Let us now run this form. Our form looks pretty good with descriptive names. In the next session, we will add logic to these controls. In the form, we have this combo box, which can be used by the user to select the worksheet names. Remember, these worksheet names represent the year for which the user would like to see the yearly sales. We have to populate the combo box with the worksheet name. I will close the form. It brings us back to our editor. In this case, we need to write our own code right here on this form. Double click anywhere in the dotted area of the form. It opens up the code window. It has a sub procedure and the form with the click event. Events are action performed by users which trigger Excel VBA to execute code. For example, when user clicks the form, it is a click event. Whatever logic we write in this procedure will automatically get executed by Excel when user clicks the form. We can write some code here if we want some action to be done when the user clicks the form. But currently, we don't need any action when user clicks the form. Instead, click this top right corner where it shows click and select initialize event. When the form is initialized, meaning when it first opens up, we need to populate the combo box with worksheet names. We have this sub procedure with initialize event. We will write some code in the sub procedure. We need to populate the combo box with worksheet names of the worksheets in the workbook. 
there could be two or three or four or twelve worksheets in the workbook. We do not know how many. I am going to introduce you to a new concept which you will use many times in VBA programming and that is called loop. There are many types of loops. Here we will use for loop. Without a loop, we may have to write many lines of code to add all the worksheet names in the combo box. Instead, we can write just one line of code using for loop. Let us declare a variable for the worksheet name. dim sheet as worksheet. Here, sheet is the variable that is of type worksheet. Let us code for loop for each sheet in worksheets next sheet. These two lines are the loop. Worksheets is a predefined object that is already designed inside Excel as discussed earlier. It is a collection of all worksheets in the workbook. Sheet is the variable we declared. So it represents a single sheet in the collection of all worksheets in the workbook. First time it will pick worksheet 2016. Take some action and then go to the next sheet that is 2017 and so on. Let us now write the code for what we want to do when Excel selects the sheet in the for loop. Me dot CMVX worksheets which is the combo box name. As discussed earlier. Me is the reserved keyword in VBA. It references the user form we created. It instructs Excel to go to the form and then the combo box control on the form. Remember, we named the combo box control as CMBX worksheets. Next, we need to add worksheet name to the combo box. Hence, code add item method. It is easy to understand if we read right to left. Add item to the combo box on the user form. And what do we want to add? We want to add the name of the sheet. So open bracket. Sheet is the variable we declared. So code sheet dot name. Close bracket. This way, Excel will get the name of the worksheet, add it to the combo box and then move to the next worksheet. The loop will work as many times as the number of sheets in the workbook. Let's try this out. Press the play button. Here is our form. Click the drop down. You see three sheets. 2016, 2017 and 2018. If a new sheet gets added, it will get picked in this drop down. In the last session, we populated the combo box with worksheet names. Now if user selects a worksheet name, Excel should navigate the user to that worksheet. Let us close the form and get back to the editor. Earlier, we added code by double clicking the form. But now, I want to add code to the combo box so that it performs an action when the value in the combo box changes. Double click the combo box. It opens up the code window. This is the sub procedure with the combo box change event. If the user changes the value in the combo box, Excel will automatically execute the code. What do we want the code to do? It should navigate to that is select the worksheet which the user selected from the combo box. 
I am going to get into the worksheets object. Typically, you need to tell which worksheet to select. You can do by index, which tells the numeric position of the worksheet, like go to the second or third worksheet. But here we need to get the worksheet which user picked from the combo box. So we need to code to get the current value of the combo box. Open bracket code me for referencing the user form dot the name of the combo box dot value close the bracket dot select. Let us run the form and see the result. The combo box shows three sheets. 2016, 17 and 18. Let me select 2017. It takes us to worksheet 2017. Let me select 2018. It takes us to worksheet 2018. In this example, we do not have too many worksheets. But think of a workbook which has 200 plus worksheets. With this code, how easy it would be to navigate through the worksheets in the workbook. In this session, we will add logic to the button control so that when user clicks the button, Excel VBA automatically inserts a new worksheet. Close the form. Remember the macro code we edited to insert a new worksheet? We want to run that code when the user clicks the button. That code was in module 1. Double click module 1. This is the code we generated through macro recorder and then we edited it to make it more dynamic and reusable. We want to run this procedure when user clicks the button. Let me copy the procedure name. Let us go back to our form. Double click form yearly sales. Double click the button. It takes us to the code window. You can notice the sub procedure for the button and the click event for the button. In this procedure, we will call the procedure or the macro which inserts a new worksheet. So I will paste the name of the procedure we copied. Press the play button again to run the form. In the form, click the button to insert a new worksheet. Guess what? It shows the dialog box to enter the year for which you want to insert a new worksheet. Let us enter 2019. Excel inserts a new worksheet 2019. This way, with a click of button, user is able to insert a new worksheet. In this session, we will add code to the text control so that it displays the total sales for the current year. The text box on the form should display the current year total sales. In the Excel workbook, cell G19 displays the total sales for the year. So we want value of cell G19 to be displayed in the text box on the form. Let us close the form and return to VBA editor. Double click to open form yearly sales. Double click the form itself. Ideally, we would want the current year total sales to be displayed in the text box when the form opens up. That is, the initialize event of the form. So we need to write the logic in the initialize event of the form. After the for loop, we need to code in such a way so that the value in the text box is equal to the value in the cell G19 on the last worksheet in the workbook. 
Why last worksheet? Because last worksheet should be the current year worksheet. So let us code me. Remember me references user form dot name of the text box txt yearly sales dot value because we want the value of the text box to be equal to the yearly sales equal to worksheets object open bracket now we need to provide the number for the last worksheet if we count the number of worksheets in the workbook the count will effectively be the number for the last worksheet hence quote worksheets dot count close bracket we need to select cell g19 so we will use the range property of the worksheets object so dot range open bracket code in quotes g19 close bracket next we need to access the value of cell g19 so code dot value now this line of code sets the value in the text box equal to the value in cell g19 on the last worksheet press the play button the text box on the form shows total sales i had added sales data in 2019 worksheet the value in the text box is equal to the value in cell g19 on 2019 worksheet which is the current year worksheet we created the user form we should make it so user friendly that user need not run the macro not every user would know the shortcut key to run the macro or how to run the macro or the form ideally the form should load automatically when the user opens the workbook close the form and return to vba editor double click module 1 it opens the code window you need a macro to show up the form add another public procedure public sub show yearly form we have given the procedure name as show yearly form now we want this procedure to show up the form hence code form yearly sales dot show form yearly sales is the name of our form and sub this code will show up the form press the play button the form pops up on the workbook close the form now you want the form to pop up as soon as the user opens the workbook in the project window notice that there is reference to all excel objects worksheets and workbook double click this workbook meaning the active workbook it opens the code window however it is general area click the general drop down and select workbook it shows a workbook open event we want the form to show up when the workbook opens we created show yearly form procedure to show up the form 
So let us code this procedure in the workbook open event. Show yearly form. When user opens the workbook, it will run this procedure and the procedure will show up the form. Close the VBA editor window. Save your Excel macro enabled workbook. Reopen the workbook. As soon as the workbook opens, the form shows up. Select 2018 from the drop down. Excel navigates to 2018 worksheet. Click the insert new worksheet button on the form. Give worksheet name as 2020. Excel inserts a new worksheet name 2020. This is our workbook with macros and user form we built in previous two case studies. Let me close the form. Hari's company has declared quarterly sales targets. Hari now wants to determine if the quarterly sales in all four quarters met the company's quarterly sales target or not. He wants to automate this information in the worksheet so that the worksheet automatically displays if the company's quarterly sales target were met or not. I will select 2016 worksheet since we have sales data entered. After the row 1, I will insert a new row. Let me add a new column for quarterly sales target. In cell H3, I will type target and also format it. In cell H2, I will enter the company's quarterly sales target as Rs. 3,45,000 and format it with currency. This amount is the sales target for every quarter. We have to define a function which will automatically detect if the quarterly sales target was met or not. In cell G7, we have the quarter 1 sales. We need to define a function which will compare the value in cell G7 with the target amount in cell H2. If the sales amount is greater than or equal to the target amount, the target is met. And hence the function should display a yes in cell H7. If the target amount was not met, it should display a no. The function should display target met or not met for all the four quarters. In the next session, we will create this user-defined custom function. In this session, you will learn how to create a user-defined custom Excel function. In the previous chapters, you have learned the syntax for inbuilt Excel functions like sum, average, VLOOKUP, etc. Remember, every function in Excel starts with an equal to sign. Next, we need to write the function name. Then, within parenthesis, we give a single or multiple arguments. A function returns a value. You will now learn how to define a custom function. Let us go to the Visual Basic Editor. On the Developer tab, in the Code section, click Visual Basic button. This is the project we have worked on in the previous case studies. Expand Modules folder. Double click Module 1. Within this module, we will create a custom user-defined function. Till now, we have created sub-procedures. Now, let us create a function. 
on the top of the screen go to insert menu select procedure we will create a new procedure till now we have been using type sub this time we will create a function procedure select type as function let us give a name to the function we will call it quarterly target remember no spaces in the name so we are creating a function with the name quarterly target press okay excel vba creates a function you have learned in previous sessions that functions need arguments to perform its job in order to determine if the quarterly sales target were met or not we need to provide two arguments first one is the target for the quarterly sales and the second one is the actual sales for the quarter let us type in the parenthesis target comma sales i have made up these names for the arguments you can give any name although optional we should provide the return value type of this function type as string our function is going to return either yes or no so this function returns a string value we have created a function named quarterly target with two arguments and the function returns a string value in the next session we will build the logic for this function in this session we will add conditional logic in our function which determines whether the quarterly sales target was met or not we have the function quarterly target with two arguments and the function returns a string value let us go to our excel worksheet in cell h7 type equal to q u a it shows our custom function quarterly target select the function the function is not complete yet go to the formula bar and click the insert function button it opens up the function arguments window we can see the two arguments we provided target and sales select the target as cell h2 and the sales as cell g7 for quarter 1 the function is trying to return a string value look at this equal to sign we haven't told the function yet what to return we need to get back to the code this function is going to return either yes if the target was met or no if the target was not met we will code if sales here sales is the info user supplied greater than equal to target remember sales and target are the information we are providing in the arguments of the function this if condition is taking the two values that the user supplied and we pass to the function through the arguments then give some blank lines and type end if this is the basic if structure now let us code quarterly target is equal to yes so if the sales is greater than equal to target the function returns a yes meaning target met 
what if the target is not met quote else quarterly target is equal to no let us go to our excel worksheet select cell h7 click the insert function again on the formula bar notice now the function returns a yes because quarter 1 target was met notice that in this window it says no help available in the next session we will add help to this function in this session we will add help to our custom defined user function quarterly target although adding help to the function is optional it is a good practice because it makes it more accessible to other users click cancel on the function arguments window and select the vba editor window click the view menu underneath it select object browser here first let me explain you about object browser in the object browser you find all the structure of any visual basic code within excel the object browser allows you to browse through all available objects in your project and see their properties methods and events you can use the object browser to find and use objects you create as well as objects from other applications currently it is showing all libraries click the drop down and select vba project it shows our vba project and everything that this particular project is made up of select module 1 notice that the members of module 1 are the three procedures we created here is the function quarterly target and the two procedures we created right click quarterly target and select properties inside this property window add a description adding a description here will show as help to the user when they use the function type the description this function calculates if the quarterly sales target was met or not it returns yes or no this description will appear as help to the user for this function save and close the worksheet In this session you will learn how to use the custom function within excel worksheet In the last session we added optional description to our function which will show as help to the user Click cell h7 Go to the formula tab on the ribbon Click insert function on the far left Inside this insert function window change the category from most recently used to user defined In select a function window it shows our custom function quarterly target It also displays the arguments and the help Press okay it brings us into the arguments window it shows the two arguments we defined target and sales select target as cell h2 and sales as g7 we want to copy this formula to other quarters also so let us make the target value absolute so we need to type dollar sign 
before H and 2. Press OK. It displays yes in cell H7. The function did its job and displayed yes because the target for quarter 1 sales was met. Let us copy the formula and paste the formula for quarter 2, quarter 3 and quarter 4. The function returns no for quarter 3 because the sales target was not met. In this session, you have learnt how to create a user-defined custom Excel function and how to use it within a worksheet. MRS company sells mobile phones and accessories across India in more than 100 cities. They need to keep track of their quarterly sales across all cities. In this case study, we will help this company determine the total quarterly sales for each city in just one click of button. This workbook consists of sales data for each city where the company sells mobile phones and accessories. Take a look at sales data for one city. It has sales data for January, February and March. Then the total quarterly sales for each product. We need to find the total sales for the quarter. If we have to do it manually, we can use the sum function. If there are two or three worksheets, it could be simple. But if there are more than 100 worksheets, it becomes tedious. So let us automate this using Visual Basic for applications. With a single click of button, the company manager should be able to find the quarterly sales for all the cities. In this session, we will automate the sum function. We will find the quarterly sales for the company for one city with a single click of button. Let us open the Visual Basic Editor. Press the shortcut key Alt plus F11 to open the Visual Basic Editor. Since we did not record anything using a macro recorder, we do not have any module. We need to create a module. Go to the Insert tab and select Module. Next, create the procedure. Go to the Insert tab again and select Procedure. Now before we start coding, let us understand how we would have done it if we would have done it manually. Let us go back to our Excel workbook. We have Mumbai sheet selected. To find the quarterly sales, we can use the SUM function with the range of cells E3 to E14. The starting cell is always going to be E3. But if more products get added, the last cell can change. It could be E14, E15 or E16. We don't know. In all the other worksheets also, the total sales column always starts from E3. There it is. E3. Next worksheet, E3, another worksheet, E3. So the part that is going to change is the last cell. So when we automate the sum function, the sum range will start from E3, but we need to find out the last cell. Let us go back to the Visual Basic Editor. Since we need to find the last cell, let us declare a variable. Dim last cell as string. This variable is going to hold a string value that is going to make reference to the last cell's address, whether it is cell E15 or E20, whatever it is in the quarterly sales column. We need to tell the procedure 
that when someone runs this, it needs to jump to E3 column. Get the range object. It should go to cell E3 and select the cell E3. Starting range E3 for the sum function is constant for all the worksheets. Next, we need to find the last cell. If we had to find the last cell manually in the worksheet, we could have pressed Ctrl key and down arrow. So, we need to program the shortcut key Ctrl and the down arrow. Let us code selection dot end in bracket Excel down dot select. The last cell is selected, hence it is the active cell. Code last cell, the variable we declared, equals to active cell dot address. The last cell variable now holds the address of the last cell in the quarterly sales column. Now we need to build the sum formula. Where do we want this sum to show up in the sheet? We would place it just below the last cell. So we will use the command active cell dot offset one row comma zero column and select it. This command will position the active cell just below the last cell of quarterly sales column. So we are moving down one cell from where Excel down took us. This will be an empty cell. Next, we will set the value of this active cell by equating it to the sum of cell range E3 to the last cell. Now remember, the sum function takes the range of the starting cell colon last cell. So, if the last cell is E15, the sum function manually would have been sum E3 colon E15. To automate this, let us code active cell dot value equals to we will build the sum function by using concatenation of string values. So, in quotes, equal to sum open bracket e3 colon quotes closed. So, this is one string of information plus last cell plus in quotes the closing bracket. So, this is the another string of information. We found the first cell, we found the last cell for some range, then we offset down one cell, got the address of the cell to show up the quarterly sales, then changed its value by building the sum formula using concatenation of different pieces of information. Let us go back to the workbook, click anywhere outside the quarterly sales column. Click the view tab on the ribbon, click the macros button and then select view macros. Select the quarterly sales macro, press run to execute the macro. Notice that in cell E15, we got the total quarterly sales. In this example, we had less data, but imagine there could be thousands of rows in the sales data sheet. With this automation, it would be so simple to get the total sales. Currently, we automated the sum function for one worksheet. In the next session, we will automate this for all the worksheets in the workbook. In the last session, we automated the sum function to find out the quarterly sales for the MRS company. But that function is limited. It only runs once and sums up the quarterly sales in only one worksheet 
that is for one city. Now we will take a step further and automate our procedure so that it sums up the quarterly sales for all the worksheets that is for all the cities in just one click of button. We are going to use the loop concept which we have discussed in previous case studies also. We are going to loop our quarterly sales procedure so that it sums up the quarterly sales for all the cities. Let us open the Visual Basic Editor, press the shortcut key Alt plus F11. We still have our quarterly sales procedure that we created. We can write a for loop within this procedure to loop through all the worksheets. But a good programming practice is to reuse your procedures for other scenarios. If we write the loop in the same procedure, it will always loop and we may not be able to use this procedure for some other scenarios. Let us create another procedure. Go to the insert tab and select procedure. We will name it as loop quarterly sales. Declare a variable dim i as integer. This i variable, we will use it within the loop. It is going to iterate from 1 to 2 to 3 till it loops through all the worksheets. Let us now code the structure for the loop for i equals to 1. 2. Now the loop starts from 1, that is the first worksheet. We need to loop as many times as the number of worksheets. How do we know how many worksheets are there in the workbook? As the company grows, they will keep adding new worksheets for new cities. Now remember the worksheets object? It is a collection of all the worksheets in the workbook. So we will use the worksheets object code worksheets dot and we will use the count property of the worksheets object. We are telling the procedure to start from the first worksheet and loop as many times as the number of worksheets in the workbook. Code next i to complete the loop. Now we need to write the code for the action to be done within this loop. We need to do two things. First, we need to select the worksheet. So, worksheets i dot select. If the value of i is 1, first worksheet gets selected. If the value of i is 2, second worksheet gets selected and so on. Once we have selected the worksheet, we would want to find the quarterly sales. That is what the quarterly sales procedure did. So we will use the procedure we created earlier. Quote quarterly sales. When the loop is on the first worksheet, it sums up the quarterly sales for the first worksheet, that is the first city. When it is on the second worksheet, it sums up the quarterly sales for the second worksheet, that is the second city. So the loop will continue till it sums up the quarterly sales for all the cities. So simple. A simple loop selects the worksheet and uses our previous procedure to sum up the quarterly sales for all the worksheets in the workbook. Let us go back to the workbook. We are on the first worksheet, Mumbai. Click the View tab. Select Macros. Select View Macros. Select Loop Quarterly Sales Procedure. Press Run. We got the sales for all the cities. Notice we are on the last worksheet. Let us check the other worksheets also. Yes, we have the sales summed up for all the worksheets. 
This is really efficient. 